So um, the topic is going to be uh, the deal with uh, FFastMath. Uh, so for those of you who were not here for the last lightning talk or have already forgotten what we talked about there, um, Klaus actually presented us basically this uh, example. Um, he was saying, uh, okay, like we, we, we start out uh, with the loop that um, basically sums up the, um, the square uh, of the, uh, the squares of the elements from the vector. Um, which is basically equivalent to the uh, inner product algorithm. Um, and uh, Klaus was um, looking in particular at the uh, performance of this algorithm um, and was comparing that um, to a um, handwritten implementation. Um, and the, uh, the crucial part here is that he, uh, he tried to manually unroll the loop body. Um, so he started out with this uh, simple unrolling where he just did uh, two iterations uh, instead of one per, uh, per loop iteration. Um, but uh, that didn't actually change much. The, the interesting part was when he um, also switched to using uh, two accumulators for the loop and then only uh, summed them up in the end. Um, and what uh, he found out is actually that, that this manually unrolled version is a lot faster. So I benchmarked this again on, on my machine. I think the numbers are a little bit different from what Klaus said, but it's, it, it, it basically gives you the idea. So like these two are pretty much equivalent and this one is, is clearly faster. Um, and uh, the, the question that I asked during the talk, which we didn't really have the time to discuss is, um, since this is a, a computation on, on doubles, so floating point numbers, um, does the result actually change if you compile it with the FFastMath option? Um, and when I tried this at home with FFastMath, uh, it actually did change because now all three versions are actually faster. Um, and this lightning talk, uh, I, I will try to explain why that happened. Um, first of all, that does not invalidate the, the point that Klaus was trying to make. Um, that in many situations, actually, you, um, especially if you do like this, this, this kind of number crunching, um, you um, cannot always rely on the compiler. Like oftentimes, really handwritten code does perform faster, especially for these uh, highly performance critical kernels. It's just that the example that he chose uh, for, for his talk was actually not sophisticated enough uh, into tricking the compiler uh, into generating bad code. Um, but what is the deal now with, with, uh, with uh, fast math? So um, in order to understand fast math, we first need to understand floats. Um, and to understand floats, we start with ints because ints are way easier than floats. So <laughs> if we look at the, at the set of natural numbers, it's, it's quite easy. We, we just have like numbers like, I, I'm only looking at the, the positive numbers here, but you can imagine uh, it, uh, the symmetrical case, which is equ uh, equivalent. So we, just have numbers, right? And if we want to model these numbers, that we, we can pretty much model that one to one with a type like int, right? Like each each of these numbers, we, we can place one sampling point on there. And okay, eventually we, we will run out of uh, out of bits in in the uh, in the int for additional sampling points. But until that point is pretty much a, a one to one correspondence. Um, with float, what we're trying to sample is the real numbers. And the problem with the real numbers is that, that it's a continuum. And sampling a continuum is not that easy because like be between each two sample points that I chose, no matter how closely I put them together, there, there's still like an, an infinity in between that, that I missed, right? So um, like, how, how should I do this, right? Um, and the, the way uh, that the floats are trying to solve this is, um, they actually uh, put uh, sampling points um, at um, varying distances and they choose the distances in such a way that the relative distance between two sampling points uh, is always more or less constant. So um, the bigger my, my number gets, um, the bigger the, the distance between adjacent sampling points gets. And that way the, the, um, the relative error that, that I make by um, having to um, to go to, to one of these discrete sampling points um, is always more or less the same. So it's really about like um, getting a grip of the relative error. That, that is, that is the, the important point here. Um, however, 
um, l let's say I, I do some, some computation with, with some floats and the result probably will <coughs> not hit exactly one of the sampling points. It will probably be like somewhere in between, right? Like some, some real number that is not representable in the floats. And then what will happen is uh, as soon as I try to save this result, um, it will actually jump to the nearest sampling point. And that is when I make an error. It's, it's like this jump. That, that's the, the rounding error that I make with, with every float computation, just because I cannot necessarily store, I cannot represent all of the results of, of all floating point computations. Um, and because of that, um, this, this little trick that, that Klaus made here by, uh, by, by separating the accumulators, that actually changes the computation. Um, so if, for example, we imagine that um, we, we keep adding numbers that, that are more or less the, 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 the same size, and, and we add a lot of these numbers. Um, and eventually, like towards the end of the loop, we, we run out of precision and we, we have to start rounding. Then in the uh, version with uh, just a single accumulator, that, that happens that at this point, like fairly at the end of the loop, and I have like a few more iterations where I have to calculate with rounding errors. But if, if I have the two accumulators, then probably um, I can complete the whole loop without ever having to round once. Um, and only in the final edition, I, I make the rounding error. So it's a different behavior. Um, and I can actually reproduce that by uh, generating uh, input numbers that actually um, let me run in, into, into these rounding problems. So for example, uh, for, uh, for my little benchmark, I just generated a whole bunch of random numbers. Um, and um, they, they are of a relatively big range, so um, they, they, they can get quite big in the end. And uh, that, that is what produces the, the, the rounding errors in my examples. I, I have some very big numbers in there, and eventually I will run out of precision to, to store the result um, exactly. Um, so um, the, the, the overall result of the inner product computation will be somewhat in the order of 4.47 uh, to the power uh, 47, which is well within the range of what double can handle. Like with double, I can go up to exponents like 300, I think. So this is this is still okay. This this is not something where where double gets at the limits of of its capacity. Um, and now, if I actually um, start comparing the results of the computations, I see that the the first two they actually um, yield exactly the same result. Um, but with the unrolled version, I actually get a, a, a slight mismatch. There, there's a slight error. So as you can see here, the, uh, the, the magnitude of the error is a lot smaller than the, the magnitude of the, of the number that I'm computing. So the relative error is still small. But it's still a mismatch. It's still a different computation. And that is what prevents the compiler from applying this optimization. Because the compiler cannot change the computation without us explicitly allowing him to. Like the semantics of these floating point operations are well defined, and the compiler is not allowed to, um, to change that, to change the result. Unless we say f fast math. That, that, that's exactly what f fast math does. It says, okay, like you're allowed to, to make like certain assumptions about floating point numbers that are not necessarily true. But they won't introduce like major errors. They will introduce like small rounding errors. Um, so as soon as we compile with that fast math, actually also all of the three not only perform the same, but they also calculate the same different result. Um, and an additional hint, if you actually look at the uh, reference page for, for inner product, um, on, on CPP reference, uh, they, they actually have a note there that um, for the transform reduce, which is the parallel version of this, um, it actually requires that the, the operations involved in the inner product have to be commutative, commutative and associative, which the floating point addition and multiplication typically are not. Um, and uh, because in, in the parallel case, uh, the compiler needs to be able to reorder the, um, the operations and make optimizations such as the one that Klaus showed last time, they require this so that you, you get the guarantee that the result will still be the same no matter how the compiler chooses to parallelize it. Okay, so that, that's the secret behind FastMath. <laughs>